they're not gonna um, we're not gonna do the 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 same requires we're gonna create our own requires right so we're gonna look at t accounts as opposed to journal entries just because um, I think t accounts are a little bit more tricky for some of us um, and so in Waldo limited what we are given is we're given um, the yearly amount so we're given the yearly amount for 2016 uh, it's the accumulated total so that's the total on the uh, right hand side of um, page 141 and then on the left hand side the column on the left hand side is the monthly total for the month of february okay um, and if we have a look at that we're gonna go through an exercise just now where we're going to try and calculate the um, cost to company right so uh, students, as a rule of thumb, whenever you get a question, you're just going to have to um, go through and, and calculate these amounts, right? So remember the amounts that we need. The first amount is we have to get gross salaries, okay? Um, and, and in this question, it's given to us. So we've got gross salaries of 82,000. Um, then we have to get deductions, okay? Um, and in this question, it's given to us and net pay, right? Obviously, those two work together. Um, and the other thing that we have to calculate are the contributions from the company. So when you get a, a, an employee benefits question, for some reason, students um, are scared of the section. It's not a section that you need to be scared of. Um, we've done basically everything you need to know in class. What you need to do is calculate these amounts if you're not given these amounts. Please calculate the, 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 those four amounts. So the four amounts, again, gross salaries, um, deductions, net salaries, and contributions. When you add all of those amounts together, or when you add, sorry, not all of the amounts, when you add the gross salaries plus the contributions together, you're going to get um, what? What are you going to get? Type it out in the chat. What, what amount do you get when you add gross salaries and uh, company contributions or employer contributions together, what amount do you get? Yes, you get cost to company. So we ultimately, we want to be able to have all the amounts available for us so that we can work through the question. So as a rule of thumb, during reading time, I normally just calculate those amounts, okay? Um, Right, so let's have a read through of the information and we shall um, then try and calculate the amount that's missing. What amount is missing from the information that we're given in the table? Again, pop your answer in the chat. There's an amount missing. Remember from the four amounts that we need, uh, what amount is missing? Um, let's read through the information while you guys think about what amount is missing. So it says, um, so the first part is just basically telling us, the first uh, section of the uh, information is telling us that um, the Provident Fund is a defined contribution plan, which is cool because we sort of know that in back to 100, we're not going to get anything but a defined contribution plan. So that's okay. Um, and then it says point two. Now point two under additional information. So that's on the next page, which is page 142. Uh, is very important. So let's look at point two. It says Waldo Limited makes an equal contribution to the employee's deduction for the Provident and the UIF. Okay, so for the Provident Fund and the UIF, equal contribution. Okay, um, and then it goes on to say Waldo Limited also contributes half of the medical aid amount payable by the employee. In other words, the employee funds um, two thirds of the total medical contributions. So what does this mean? Equal contributions are easy. We go to the monthly amount for um, uh, February, so the February 2016. And if you have a look at, at Provident, um, how much is there? Provident is, Provident contributions by the worker is 4,000 Rand. So, the company is going to contribute equally to that. So that's going to be 4,000 Rand on the company's behalf. Then we've got uh, UIF, which is 500 Rand. So that's 4,500 Rand contributions by the company. 
And then it says the medical aid is, they contribute half of the deduction or contribution made by the worker. So half of um, the worker's contribution is 3,000 Rand. Half of that is 1,500 Rand. So let's add those amounts together. So the 4,000 Rand contribution um, plus the 500 Rand contribution plus the 1,500 on the medical aid. How, what are the employers or companies' contributions? Type it out in the chat. What are the employers or companies' contributions? I will wait for you because this is an important amount. Okay, someone says 6,000 Rand. Um, that is correct. That's the correct amount. Okay. So, so the correct amount is 6,000 Rand. That is the company's contributions per month. Per month. Um, okay, um, so 6,000 Rand. Let's keep that at the back of our minds. Let's have a look at um, point three. So, point three says that uh, payments for employee tax provident, medical aid, and UIF are made on the 7th. So, what is that telling us about the accounts that we should be seeing? seeing. We should not be seeing bank in relation to these amounts, okay? We should be seeing a payable because it's telling us that it's only paid after the month has ended. So for those seven days from the first or from the end of the previous month to the seventh of the new month, um, for those seven days, those amounts are owing, they're outstanding, they, they are payable, okay? And as a result, when we journalizing and recording them in the general ledger, they have to be payable amounts, they cannot be bank accounts, right? So watch out for a statement like that um, in your TESO exam. Uh, it then says there's eight employees on the on 28 February 2015 and 27, uh, 2016. So that means that what it's trying to tell you is that there's been no change, there's been no movement in the number of workers that have been working, okay? During January 2015, the salary increase of two a salary increase of two percent was announced for the implementation on 1st March 2015. 1st March 2015 is the beginning of the current year. Okay, so it's the beginning of the current year. Assume no further um, salary increases other than the one stated in the information above. So nothing has been increased in. 2016, that's what they're trying to tell you. Because remember, when you're raising your provision, your provision must be forward looking. So your provision uh, must look into the new year. And if we're raising a provision in 2015, for 2016, we must take into account that increase. And same sort of story if we going from 2016 to 17. But in this question, what they've actually said is in 16, there was an increase. In 17, there was no increase. That's what that statement is trying to tell us, okay? So write that down. 16, there was an increase, but in 17, there was no increase um, on, the, on the 2016 amount. Okay, so let's have a look at annual leave, okay? So it says each employee is entitled to 15 days paid annual leave every year. Um, although the full 15 days may be carried over, the annual leave the, at the end of each year is limited to 15 days. Accumulated leave is utilized before the allocated leave for the current year is utilized. Accumulated leave is non-vesting. Okay, so when we read, let's read that statement again. Although the full 15 days may be carried forward, what does carried forward tell us? Carried forward, uh, what does it bring to mind? There's a word that we, we associate with carried forward. Type your answer in the chat. Um, so, 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 yes, so there we go. People are now saying it. It's cumulating leave. It's a cumulative leave. We know that we need to raise a provision. Okay, so there's going to be a provision here because we're dealing with cumulative leave. Um, all right, and then it says, um, so, so then the, the remainder of that sentence says, the annual leave at the end of each year is limited to 15 days. So what it's saying is, listen, you can carry as much as of the leave that you want over, but the limit is 15, right? 
So that means that um, if I want to take all of, so, so let's uh, deal with uh, our current years and we'll say in 2021, um, Yoshe went to work and he took no leave. He took zero leave. So he took all 15 days into 2022. But when he's going in 20, and then in 2022 also, he never took any days of leave. He works very hard. So he never took any days of leave. And then when he's going into 2023, he's only allowed to take 15 days, regardless of which 15 days that may be. Now, um, that is what that statement is trying to tell us. So the amount that we can carry over um, is limited to 15 days, regardless of which year those of those uh, days came from. That's what that statement is saying. And then it says the cumulative leave is utilized before the allocated leave of the current year. What is that telling us? It's telling us some sort of um, technique of using something. Let's type that. What that technique is in, in, in the in the chat. Okay. Someone says FIFO. Anyone agreeing with her? Okay, that's correct. So that statement is telling us about FIFO. Okay, so the leave is used in a FIFO method, in a FIFO way. Now, accumulated leave is non-vesting. Okay, remember, when we have a leave that's non-vesting, what do we use to calculate our provision? There's something that we use to calculate our provision. Remember, uh, so, so, so let's just look at it like this, guys. So we've got two types of leave, vesting, non-vesting, right? Everyone's comfortable with that. When we deal with non-vesting leave, we can either use the leave or we can forfeit the leave. Now, we would not account for leave that's forfeited, okay? That makes no sense. Why would you do that? Why would you account for leave that's disappeared? So we won't account for leave that's uh, forfeited. We're only gonna account for leave that's taken or used and what amount do we use when we're calculating leave that's taken? Type it in the chat. What amount do we use? That's correct. We're going to use cost to company for leave that's taken. Right. Um, then, so, so that's non-vesting leave, right? So let's just leave that aside. We've dealt with that scenario. Now, I know that this question is talking about non-vesting leave, but just for our understanding, if it was vesting, if, if the question was talking about vesting leave, we would be de dealing with two types of leave, right? Leave that can be taken as well as leave that's paid out, right? Now, leave that's taken, we still will calculate it at cost to company, but leave that's paid out, what amount do we use to calculate leave that's paid out? Type it in the chat. Correct, gross salary. Right. So, so, so everyone understands that um, under non-vesting leave, the split is between leave that's forfeited, which we don't account for, and leave that's taken, which we need to raise a provision for. And under uh, uh, vesting leave, we need to raise a provision for leave that's taken, as well as, as leave that may be paid out. Okay. And in your question, in your test, for exam, those we're going to tell you. Listen, under uh, so so it'll have like a statement that says you know based on uh, experience, um, generally you know the workers uh, get two days paid out. Now you need to know that um, whatever the worker comes in with, two days need to be calculated at gross salary, and the other two days need to or however many days need to be calculated at cost to company. Okay, so so it's not super difficult, but um, yeah, I just wanted to explain that. Let's move on to the next part of the information. So it says uh, on, on 28 February 2015, so that's at the beginning of the year. Uh, yeah, it's at the beginning of the financial year. The average number of unused leave was five days per employee. The average number of unused leave was five days per employee. Okay. Five days per employee. So that is telling us about what balance. 
what balance is that telling us about? It's the opening balance. They're trying to tell us something about the opening balance because they're talking about the beginning of the year. It then says that the average, now read this very carefully, this is a tricky statement. The average salary uh, expense for the company per day. So what amount is this? Is this gross salary or is this cost to company? The average salary expense for the company per day for the year ended in 2015 amounted to four amounted to 4,000 rand. The average salary expense, remember we used to have an account, we used to call it um, um, salary expense. And then when we started learning about um, employee benefits, we changed it to short term, we changed it to short term employee benefits. Now think about what amounts go in there? What amounts go into short term employee benefits? Uh, it's the gross salary plus the contributions, correct? The, 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 the company's contributions plus some of the company's contributions. So that amount ends up accounting for and ends up being cost to company. So if it's telling us here that the salary expense per uh, salary, average salary expense for the company per day is 4,000 rand, it's telling us that the cost to company is 4,000 rand. Okay, does everyone understand that? Should I explain it again? Because it becomes very important. Um, so, so, so the cost to company is 4,000 Rand because it's mentioning the salary expense. And we know that in the past, we used to call it salary expense, now it's short-term employee benefits. And in that account, we dump everything. We put the gross salary plus the contribution plus, we dump everything in that account. So that account ends up at the end of the day being equal to the cost to company. So therefore, if it's 4,000 Rand per day, it's, uh, and it's from the company's perspective, it is the cost to company. That's number one. Number two, uh, this is an average amount Right, so let's read it again. The average salary expense for the company per day. So how many people are being paid out of this 4,000 Rand per day? Um, we, we read earlier on that there's eight employees. How many people are being paid out from this 4,000 Rand? Okay, someone says one. Okay, so, so, so let's read the statement again. So it says the average salary expense for the company. So if it's from the company's perspective, the company has to pay all eight employees, you can't only pay one. They need to pay all of the employees, right? So because it's from the company's perspective, it, 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 that 4,000 Rand is covering the salary of all of the employees, all eight of the employees. So, so we know that there's eight employees. All eight of the workers are being paid from that 4,000 Rand. So this is an accumulative amount. It's a big amount. Does everyone understand that? It's not, it's not per employee. Because if, if the sentence said the average salary per employee per day, now that's a different statement. All right? But it doesn't say per employee. It's not a per employee. It's from the company's perspective. Therefore, um, the, why do they say average salaries? Very good. So when we when we are compiling the uh, accrual for a group of employees, we have to use averages. So we're never going to get um, the 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 actual amounts, right? We're always gonna get an average. Uh, another reason why they have to average it out is because on some days, uh, some pe people might work overtime. On some days, what you find is they might have a casual worker. And so um, over time, when you average it out, it comes to this amount of 4,000 Rand. So that's why it says average employees. Uh, so the average salary. 
um, is because of those sorts of day-to-day -day variations that they're going to average out, uh, it's going to come to 4,000 rand. Okay. Any questions about that statement? That sta that uh, piece of information is actually like the 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 the, the big the big piece of information. Okay. Um, so let's, if you have a question, pop it in the chat, but let's just move on to uh, the next part of the information. So it says on uh, 28 February, 2016, the average number of employees, uh, average number of unused leave was seven days per employee. Okay. Uh, the entity still has to recognize the relevant leave pay liability at uh, 28 February 2016. So they've given us five days as the opening balance and seven days as the closing balance. Does that make sense to everyone? Because they've said in 2015, it was five days, 2016, seven days, right? So that's, that's what they basically told us there. It then says, Waldo Limited, and point number seven now, I'm reading point number seven, Waldo Limited in accordance with the company's policy, pay 5% of the profit for the year to employees within 12 months. So it's telling us it's short-term benefit uh, and it's 5% of the profit. Now we need to figure out what the profit is. It, the, the next sentence is the profit for the year ended 28 uh, February 2016 before the provision for the payment of 5% of the 5% amounts to 2.429,000. So 2,429,000. Okay. Okay, and then it says the year end is 2018. Uh, the year end is 28 February. So we now know how to calculate the, the bonus. Let's, in our rough workings, let's calculate the bonus. So we're going to take uh, our calculators and we're going to say uh, two, four, um, two, nine, and then three zeros uh, times by zero point of times by 0 0.05, and we're going to get an amount of 121, that's the correct amount, 121,450. So let's keep that amount in the back of our minds. Um, so I'm just going to type out here, so the uh, employer's contribution was uh, 6,000, which we calculated during reading time, and uh, that amount of 1214, uh, 50 is also our our um, provision for bonus. Right, so we've got all of our wants. Let's try and look at the required. So the required says, so this is our adjusted required. Um, the required says, um, let's create the leave pay accrual account as well as the um, short-term employee benefits account. Okay, and then it says for the year ended. So it's telling us that we need to create it for the year, right? Does that does that make sense? Okay, so it says for the year. Um, the next thing is when we let's try and compose that opening balance so we know that in 2015 there was um i'm gonna write in fact i should actually just clear this one and then start again so i'm gonna write in blue this time so that everyone can see clearly so if we have a look at this 4,000 Rand, this is something that we were told in the question. It was 4,000 Rand. And then we're going to increase it. And remember, that was cost to company for all eight employees, right? So all eight employees are included in this 4,000 Rand. Um, we're going to increase it by 2%, which is what we're doing here. And where did we get that piece of information? Point number five, it says that the salary increase was 2% in 2016. Why are we increasing it? Because remember, we're raising this at the beginning of the opening balance. Um, we're increasing it uh, for the salary increase because the provision is always forward looking. We are predicting that we're going to have to pay this out in the future. So therefore we need to increase it so that it's relevant to the future. Does that make sense? So that's why we take into account the salary increases when we calculate 
the provision because when it is actually paid out, it's going to be paid out at, or when it is actually used at least, it's going to cost the company that extra 2%. So that's why we have to take that into account, the 2% increase. And then we know that the opening balance is five days. So we say five days there. We add that into our calculators and we're going to get uh, 20,400 rand, right? That's not too hectic. Now, the question doesn't tell us how many days are used, right? It just tells us that there were five days at the beginning that were brought over. Then the current year, they would have gotten 15 days. And then they were left with seven days at the end of the year. So how many days do you think um, they used? What, what is your estimation? Uh, let's, let me type it out. So they, they came with five days. Then we add on the, the 15 days. That's going to give us 20, right? We then take the 20 and we minus seven because that's what they were left with. Um, and someone's already typed it in the chat, and the answer is 13. So they actually used 13 days. Okay. Um, and because it's based on a FIFO method, we know that the first days that were used were the five days that they brought over from 2015. Okay. As a result, we need to eliminate the liability because the liability is no more available. The, the five days have been used up. And this is what's happening in this debit here. So they're debiting the liability, meaning they're decreasing it. Remember, liabilities increase on the credit side. So they're decreasing the liability because it's no more available. It's been used up. And they're debiting it by the full amount. Why by the full amount? Because remember, the 4000 is cost to company, and the person has taken the day off. It's non-vesting. So the person has taken the day off and therefore, it needs to be calculated at cost to company. Um, and so we're decreasing the liability. Now, there's going to be a period of time during the year when, um, when these amounts, are this, this account is going to be zero, right? But let's ignore that. And then we fast forward to the end of the year. Um, now, they gave us the cost to company uh, at the beginning of the year of 4,000 rand. We increased it by the 2%. And the, the rationale is that there's no need for us to go and recalculate the cost to company because it was given to us at the beginning of the year, right? Um, there wasn't, we don't have to, um, we, we don't have to recalculate it. So we can still use that, that um, 4,000 rand that we were given at the beginning of the year. Um, and if we do that, if we use the 4,000 Rand, then we have to increase it by 2% because that 2% increase is not an increase that happening, that's going to happen next year. It's an increase that has already happened. We're just bringing the amount back to what is being paid in 2016. And remember, there's no increase in 2017, so we don't need to increase it again. And then the seven years outstanding at the end of the at the end of the um, at the end of the uh, year. Now, sorry, we should have actually put the calculation here because um, it's a provision and it increases on the um, credit side. So anyway, no. So so the four thousand rand that we're reading about won't be inclusive of the two. 2% increase. The reason is, how do we know that? Because it's we are told that the average salary per year for 2015 is 4,000 rand. And then later on, or, or previously in point five, we're told that the increase took place on 1 March 2015, whereas this amount is as at 20, 28 February 2015. Do you understand that the 4,000 rand was calculated one day before the increase came into effect? Okay, so because of that, we can we can gauge that the the 4,000 rand does not take into account the two percent increase. Okay. Um, yeah. So 
If it doesn't make sense, please just tell me and I can repeat it. Um, so anyway, so that's the amount that is raised, uh, which is 28,560. Um, and that's the balance that will be the closing balance. That's how the account will end, okay, for the year. That's how the account will end. So now let's have a look at what our short-term employee benefits account will look like. Um, we are going to click there. Okay, so short-term employee benefits. Um, if you have a look, so again, it's telling us that we need to calculate it for the year. So, so it was clear in the question that they asked us for the year to, to create the account for the entire year. That's why it says the year ended, right? It doesn't say for a specific month or, or something like that. It says the year ended, and therefore we know that we need to calculate it for the whole year. Um, and and so when we look at the yearly amount, so now we're going to focus on the column on the on page 400, 141, so the previous page on the right hand side, only those columns, only that column is the yearly column. Only those numbers are the yearly numbers. So we're going to put the net salary of 625 which is the amount that's the last amount on the table so 625 the last amount on the table net salary uh, we're then going to add on the the um, salary the, the, the at least the, the pay and then the provident now notice the provident fund is only 48000 so the question is where is the company's contribution because remember the company contributes equal amounts for the provident, right? Now, this we spoke about yesterday, but when the company is deducting from the person, person's salary, from the worker's salary, it is still considered part of the salary because he's taking the salary and then he's removing a specific amount. So therefore, the worker's contribution needs to be recorded like a salary would have been recorded. And a salary would have been recorded in the short-term employee benefits account. They are just withholding, they're just helping the worker out by paying this over to someone else, that being the provident fund. And therefore, in, when we look at this, what was previously called the salaries account, now we're going to call it the short-term employee benefits account, we should be seeing this amount of 48,000 sitting there. But the company's contributions is the company paying for the benefit of its employee or its worker in the future. Therefore, we can't put it into this account because this account by definition is short term, right? So we've got a separate account. We sometimes call it the um, post-employment benefit. Now you guys are familiar with, with that journal account name because in the past we've passed journal entries the post-employment benefit account, right? And that's where the company's contribution is going to be sitting. You're going to see it in the next slide when we look at what the disclosure looks like, right? So, so that's where the contribution for provident fund for the company is actually sitting in a separate account because the nature of it is separate. Remember, this contribution that's being made by the worker is us withholding part of his salary. It's not a it's not a contribution um, for his benefit. It's just us withholding part of his salary and paying it on his behalf. We're helping him, but when we pay for his uh, retirement benefit, then it is actually us incurring a cost for the benefit of our employee that goes into retirement. The nature is different to a salary, and therefore we have to record it in a separate account. When we look at the when we look at the um, Medical aid benefit, however, we see that this amount relates to the company's contribution. And the reason for that is because the benefit can be assumed to be short term. It's not a long term. We're not paying for someone's retirement. We're paying for uh, something that they possibly might use uh, soon, which is, which is medical aid. Or the benefit that they're getting from the medical aid is continuous. And therefore, um, it, it falls under short term contribution or short term benefit. Right. 
So we taking the 36 which we got from our table, and that is the uh, 36 that's in line with medical aid fund contributions under the yearly column. That's 38,000. We divided it by two because we told that the company only uh, um, contributes half of what the worker contributes. And we're adding those two amounts together to get uh, 54,000. Okay. Uh, UIF contributions, very similarly, we are told that they match the UIF contribution. So it's the 6,000 that the worker is contributing times two. Remember, it's all of these are very different to the provident. Where the provident, we recognize it in a separate account. Okay, um, the accruals, in terms of the accruals, it's sort of the accruals that we raised already. So the 28,000 from the previous page, as well as the reversal that happened during the year, possibly at the beginning of the year uh, for the 20,400, uh, uh, 20, right? Now this amount of bonus provision is the amount that we calculated a little while ago while we are reading. Um, it's also a short-term benefit because it's going to be paid, and the question tells us within 12 months. Right? If the question didn't tell us that, then we would have had to assume, but um, our questions don't, won't be vague. Our questions will be very deliberate and it'll say in 12 months or outside of 12 months, and you guys will know. Um, this amount obviously is the balancing amount and the amount that eventually ends up on the income statement. So the 1,168,610 is the amount that ends up on the income statement. Okay. So let's have a look at our disclosure. So again, our disclosure for the most part is just going to be the profit before tax note. There's no individual note for this section. Um, and the post-employment benefits, like I said, only records the company's contributions, whereas the workers' contributions is pushed into short-term employee benefits. And the amount that we see here is pulled out from, so the, so the one one is pulled out from the account that we just created. So this one one here where the blue dots are appearing. And this obviously is an amount equal to the contribution made by the worker of 48,000. So let's write a rule, and that rule is going to be, um, I'm typing it out now, post-employment benefits is only uh, employer's contribution, all right? So the employer's contribution. So... Um, that is our rule that we need to remember. So post-employment benefits is only the employer's or the company, the company's contribution. Everyone got that? Any questions about that? Everyone understand the difference? So the, the worker's contribution is going to go into short term, whereas the company's contribution is going to go into post-employment benefits. Okay. Now, we, we went through this process and we created all of these liabilities. Now, I just want to take some time and just look at the different liabilities that we created. Okay, so this is what the slide here is. So the first liability we created is, remember, we paid the employees uh, the net salary. So the, so, so, the, so the liabilities that are remaining at the end of the month of February, remember now for this part of the question, for this part of our discussion, we can't look at the year because we know that at the seventh of every month, the payment is gone out. So the only uh, uh, liabilities that will be remaining uh, will be the, those of February, those that relate to February. So what liabilities are remaining? So firstly, we're gonna have a liability. So if we look at the uh, left-hand column in our table on page 141, um, PAYE, we're still going to need to pay it. We're going to have to pay it, obviously, on the 7th of March. So that's going to be there. That's 22,500. Then we've got our provident from the worker's contribution of 4,000 rand. Then we've got our medical aid from the worker's contribution of 3,000 rand. And um, 5,000 rand for the medical aid. Now, the next amount, so, 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 so when we add all of that up, we're going to get our 30,000 liability, right? So that's the first amount that's, that's owing. 
The next amount, 6,000 Rand, is the amount that we calculated for the company or the employer's contribution. Okay, and remember how we calculated that? It was the Provident Fund of 4,000 plus the UIF of 500, and then half of the medical aid, so 1,500 for medical aid. And that gives us 6,000. Okay, so that's where that amount comes in. Um, another liability that we left over was the actual uh, leave accrual. Right, of 28,560. And then because we told that um, the bonus will be paid you know, within the next 12 months, we also know that that amount has not been paid at the end of the year. So uh, that amount is going to be uh, 121,450. So these are the liabilities that we left after all of our journal entries were passed. Right? And uh, uh, this amount of 186,010 uh, rand is what will appear in the other uh, trade and other payables, right? So as a portion of trade and other payables, there's going to be 186,000 that relates to um, employee benefits, okay? So I just wanted to break that up and calculate that so that we were uh, aware of it. Now, any questions so far? Does anyone have anything that they're not sure about that they want me to go over again? Um, please speak now. Uh, but even if you don't speak now, you don't have to hold your peace because we can do, we can go through it in consultations. Okay. Um, so now what we're going to talk about is long term employee benefits. Okay. I just want to jog your memory for a little bit. Um, when we spoke about short-term employee benefits, we said there's two defining characteristics. Remember, two defining characteristics for short-term employee benefits. The first uh, characteristic is that it is paid within 12 months after the reporting period in which the um, service was rendered. That means if we have a year that runs from January to December, so that's our financial year. We have a, a, a financial year that runs from 21, uh, from January 2021 to December 2021. We can then say that if someone did work on the 1st of January, right, this year, he did work on the 1st of January this year, and he earned a bonus because of that work, right? If he is paid, before 31st December 2022, it's still considered short-term employee benefits, right? Because the statement is it must be paid within 12 months after the period in which the service was rendered, okay? So even if he did the work on 1 January and we only pay him a salary uh, uh, 31st December 2022, it's still short term. Okay, so that's the first defining characteristic. And the other defining characteristic for short term employee benefits is that it is, it relates to the service being rendered. Now, when we look at long term employee benefits, um, it still relates to a service being rendered. So that, per, that second characteristic hasn't changed. It must still relate to a service being rendered, right? However, the payment can happen outside of the 12 months after the annual reporting period. So if someone did work on the 1st of January, 2021, and he earned a salary, if we now pay him on the 1st of January, 2023, it's unfortunately outside of the 12 months following the reporting period. And therefore, and therefore, it is uh, long-term, okay? Um, so what can be long-term? Um, long-term can be, for example, in academia, we have a thing called sabbatical leave when you're doing your PhD. That generally is a long-term employee benefit because they're giving you a day of leave, a day of sabbatical leave. So I think at UP, we earn um, two days per month, right? 
So you earn two days of sabbatical leave per month, but they know that you're only going to take it um, once in five years, maybe once in six years or seven years. Some people even take it once in 10 years. So because they know that it will not be taken, it will not be used up within a 12 month, within the 12 months following the, the reporting period, therefore it is considered a long-term leave, a long-term employee benefit. So when you account for it, you're not going to put it in your short-term employee benefits account. You're going to have a, an account for long-term employee benefits expense. Okay. So that's what sabbatical leave is. Uh, you might also have a situation where you have a bonus that is being paid. The bonus was earned in 2021, but as part of, remember we spoke about substantive conditions when it comes to bonus of, uh, bonuses, substantive conditions are conditions that hold back the bonus from being paid. So someone worked for the whole year of 2021, they earned a bonus. But the substantive condition is that this person remains employed for 12 months after the bonus was earned. So he has to be employed. He worked from 1 January to 31st December 2021. He has to be employed for the whole of 2022. right? And because we can only raise that substantive condition and because we can only uh, uh, pay that bonus after the condition is met, we need to wait for those 12 months. And in us waiting for those 12 months, we're going to now push ourselves outside of short-term employee benefits into long-term employee benefits because we're paying it outside of the 12 months after the reporting period. Okay, so any questions? Do you understand what, uh, in terms of a definition, it's very simple. It's the, all the same stuff as short term, but just this time it's outside of the 12 months after the reporting period. Okay, so nothing super hectic. In terms of our journal entry, very similar journal entry to the one that we've already passed when it comes to short term employee benefits. So we're going to create a, um, an account for long term employee benefits expense. Uh, that's a PL account, so profit and loss account, and any liabilities that come out of the leave or that come out of the bonus will be credited to a appropriate liability account. Remember, the name needs to be appropriate. Now, certain caveats that we learned about, um, when we are disclosing it, it's going to be disclosed in the profit before tax account, um, so it doesn't have its own account. And then finally, um, if there is any uh, management, key management personnel, we're going to have to disclose those guys separately because they earn a lot of money. So we have to disclose them separately. So like I said, so this is what um, uh, the balance sheet might look like. So it'll look like uh, uh, where we have a liability. Uh, I, it's the liability obviously going to sit under long-term liabilities because it's more than 12 months away. Um, and uh, if there are any short-term liabilities, they generally are going to be related to short-term employee benefits, so we don't need to worry too much about that. Um, and then this is what our disclosure will look like in the notes. Again, we're going to have short-term and post-employment benefits, which we know about. The only new thing that we're adding is the long-term employee benefits. And then key personnel. Uh, there's normally a spiel or a story at the end. Okay. So termination benefits. Now this is the last type of benefit that we're going to cover. Uh, in termination benefits, the remember when we spoke about short term, we said there's two things. It must be within 12 months. It must be with regard to services rendered. When we spoke about post employment benefits, we said that it must be. Um, in relation to services rendered, and it must um, be for the after the employment has ended. So it must be post the employment, right? That's post employment benefits, which is what we now call defined contribution plans. Um, and then when we just now spoke about long term employee benefits, we said it must be outside of the 12 months and must be related to services rendered. So there were two requirements for the first three types of employee benefits. For this type, which is termination benefits, there's one requirement. 
okay? There's one requirement for termination benefits. And that one requirement is that there must be a termination of employment, right? And employment must come to an end, okay? Now, it can either be a decision from the company. So there's two parties in an in a employment relationship, right? The company and the, and the worker. It must either be a termination from the worker's uh, side where the worker uh, accepts um, that they're going to be retrenched, right? Um, or it is the company that retrenches the worker. There must be a retrenchment, right? Notice it, it does not cover necessarily dismissal. However, in some cases, uh, depending on what your um, contract, your employee contract, employment contract looks like, you might even get it during uh, resignation or dismissal, right? But for the most part in our, uh, in back to 100, we're just gonna deal with retrenchment, right? So under retrenchment, uh, either the worker must accept the retrenchment or the company must force the worker to leave. And, and in both of those cases, there can be some amounts that are paid out. Now, what amounts are we talking about? What amounts can be paid out? So firstly, they can pay just a lump sum, right? So they can actually just pay them money and say, here's a bit of money. Um, we hope that you can find another job. Goodbye. So, so that's, it can be that. There can be an agreement for them to say, listen, we're going to pay your medical aid for three months after you leave uh, um, the employment of our company. That is a termination benefit. They can say the same thing for Providence. So we're going to pay your Providence for a specific amount of time after you leave the employment. So that is a termination benefit. Um, you know, or it could be, listen, we're going to um, give you a specific amount of money for, you know, preparing for your new job or finding a new job or use of the printer or that sort of stuff, right? To, to print out CVs or, or use of the email to email your, your new, to, uh, to find a new job. Those are the types of things that are termination benefits. So when we are counting for termination benefits, we must not be shocked if we see payment to a, to a medical aid, a payment to a provident, um, a lump sum payment. Um, you know, use of a printer, those types of things are going to be there, okay? So it can be any of those, but, but the question will be very specific. And remember, termination benefits is not the thrust of what we're studying, but we have to know the definition well, right? So it's not the key to, uh, to this part of the course, but you have to know the definition well. Very similarly, um, with, with long-term benefits, the stuff that we need to be aware of is that there is no specific note for termination benefits. It's going to be in our profit before tax note and key employees need to be uh, separately disclosed. Um, and then in, in, as a group, it can fall under other expenses or employee benefit uh, expenses on the income statement. Okay, so, so that's it. In terms of disclosure, this is what the disclosure will look like again. So we're just gonna have um, an amount at the bottom here for termination benefits and um, then a little spiel at the bottom regarding key management personnel. Okay, any questions about termination benefits or long-term benefits? Do you understand the definition? If you don't understand the definitions, please, 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 please uh, ask me during consultations, which is going to start just now, or um, go through the slides because it's very it's explained in the slides. Okay. Okay, guys. So that's the end of lecture number six. And next week, Tuesday, we're going to go on to lecture number seven, which is the last and final lecture in our series on employee benefits. What is important is that we go over um, the workbook example 11.11, .11. so 11.11, 11.11 .11, um, in our blue workbook. And um, so, so that's key because in our next lecture, uh, our le next lecture is basically only going to be dealing with 11.11. .11. I'm going to take you through what I consider to be a little bit more of a tougher example, 
which is 11.11, .11, something that you can expect to see in your test for exam. Uh, other than that, uh, on Tuesday, we're also going to go through earnings per share. So it's gonna, that's a new topic, um, and it's a topic that you must uh, come for. It can be a little bit tricky, but if you come to lectures, um, you'll find it easy. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend, and I will see you on Tuesday. Bye-bye.